Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is playwright Krista Vernoff and chef Gina Pacheco. Playwright Krista Vernoff was born in Venice, California. She lived in Venice. She lived in Park City, Utah, and also Troy, New York. Krista has a degree in theater from Boston University, and I guess always wanted to be a writer, Krista. Did you get a writing job out of Boston U? Uh, no, I actually trained as an actor. <laughs> at, oh, you did? <laughs> at, I was a theater major at BU. So, oh, you were? Yeah, I, I had thought I wanted to be uh, an actor for a long time, but my senior year at BU, I took a playwriting class as an elective and pretty quickly realized that that was my calling. So you only had one year to do all that writing? Uh, <laughs> I took one class at BU and wrote a very, very bad play, um, but, I, but thought I, I got the bug. And so then I, I moved to New York to pursue acting. Oh, um, but while I, I was there, I took a screenwriting class at the New School. Oh. And then um, I moved to Portland, Oregon, and I was doing theater there and self-schooling as a writer. That's a great theater area, isn't oh, it? Oh, it was fantastic. I How did Portland. you know to go there? Um, I had a friend who was making a living as an actor who I had gone to school with. Um, and now he's famous. His name is Peter Page. He's on Queer Spoke on Showtime. Uh, but at the time, he we graduated BU, and uh, he had we'd both moved to New York, and he'd moved to Portland, and sort of said, like, there's a great theater scene here, and you can make a living. So I moved there, oh. even though I I thought I wanted to be a writer. I I, I was being told by my family that I probably was just afraid to be an actor, which made sense. I had always wanted to be an actor, and so. You look like an actor. Well, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Um, uh, so I, I moved to Portland, and after I spent um, a year making a living almost entirely as an actor, I was still doing some singing waitressing over Christmas, but most of my money that year was made acting. I felt like I had proven that I could do that, and I knew that it wasn't where my heart was. I was I was running off stage every night in between scenes, writing in the dressing room. Oh. So I, it was time. I, the last show I did, I closed the show and uh, packed up my car with my boyfriend at the time and drove down here. I put my headshots in storage. I never told anyone I was an actor. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. No, no one in Los Angeles knew that for a long so, time. So here you were in LA, and how'd you get into TV? Because you obviously got into Fox and ABC and NBC. Mm -hmm. I mean, you did a lot of, t you've done a lot of TV writing. I, I continue to do TV writing. It's it's my main gig. Um, uh, I came down here to pursue TV writing. It was my specific oh, goal. you knew that. When I took that screenwriting class at the new school, I had been told by the teacher that I had an ear for dialogue, but, but I, the, my ear for dialogue was far more effective than my visual storytelling, and that that lent itself more to television than to screen than oh. to movie writing or theater. Did you think of theater? Well, I did, but I had this um, profound respect for theater that <laughs> I I thought like I could never really be a playwright, but TV I can do. You know? <laughs> I was raised in the theater, and it was too. It was it was a, a high goal to Isn't me. Isn't that so. funny? But you were oh. But you watch TV all the time, maybe because it was familiar? There's was that feeling. Familiar? It was familiar and also just there was a certain amount of contempt for TV as I was the way I was raised. Now, I love television and I, I, I have, that has changed in me since, but I was raised by hippies. I wasn't allowed to watch TV. Theater, you oh, know, my I mom see. was an actor. Oh. It, was, it was sort of like, that is hard. TV, maybe I could do. I watched <laughs> it, I thought I could write that. So. Um, <laughs> I started writing TV. I, this is the play that we're here to talk about is my first play since that little play I wrote in college. But, but tell us just a little bit. You did Time of Your Life for Fox. My first, my very first job was a freelance episode of Law and Order. Which oh, so you did was, Law and Order. You've done Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I did Time of Your Life for Fox. Then I did, well, I did three years on Charmed. Oh. And then I did uh, for the what WB. What was that, Charmed? 
What is Charmed. Uh, it's a show about sister witches fighting evil demons in San Francisco. It was Alyssa Milano. It's still on, on TV. It's Alyssa Milano, uh, Rose McGowan, and Holly Marie Combs. Did you do it from down here? You didn't have to go to uh, San Francisco. Oh, no. It shoots here. It it's shoots. set in San Francisco, but it shoots here. <laughs> that, was, that was like, I grew up on Charmed, is what I say. I spent three years on that show. Oh, and that's how, and w were you actually writing full episodes, or were you a group, a group of you writing? Or? No. Um, in TV, there's a, there's a writer's room, but what we do is we work together to outline an awesome. episode or to break we call it breaking a story and then we each go off and write individual episodes on our own so I wrote I think over three years I wrote 12 or 13 episodes so of that Charmed. That was a lot. Yeah yeah. Do you all get along when you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean how could three people, four people? Do eight we, people, nine people, eight, ten people yeah because really? well, you're doing 22 episodes in a season and there's writing teams. Who, um, how do they know what episode Most to give you? Most of the time you, you get along. <laughs> How do they know what to give you? Well, you come in and you pitch. So at the beginning oh, of the see. season, at Charmed anyway, you had to come in with five episode ideas and you pitch and uh, the showrunner, who's the head writer in TV, sort of would hear the pitches and say, well, that, you know, we're trying to do this emotional arc for the season and, you know, oh, that I episode see. might fall well as number three. Or So you sort of, you come in with ideas and then he assigns you an episode number and then you run the room, you sort of drive the room with everybody's assistance while you're breaking your story. For that For that, that episode. Time. And then if it's I mean, my story on the board, I'm breaking it with the team and then I take it, I go off to write an outline and then everybody starts working on the next episode together. And then by the time I'm done writing that one, I come back to the room and the person who's writing the next one goes off to write. I so there's see. all there's a rotating it's a room. Ro and then you help him when he comes back or you help the next person. Yes, you're all, you, in, you're you help each other in, in, in the story breaking stage. I see. Yeah. And then Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy is uh, a new show um, that's going to premiere on March uh, on ABC in March. And uh, it's a medical dramedy. You're doing. It's, you're supervising producer That's along my with title. writer. What does that mean? Um, in television, there are eight levels of writer. So oh. it starts with staff writer, and then it goes to story editor, executive story editor, to co-producer, producer, supervising producer, oh, so co-executive producer. I'm a six. <laughs> <laughs> a co-executive producer and executive producer. So any of those titles that you see when you watch TV show, yeah. those are all the writers. That's the writing staff. That's the writing staff. So you start at writer slash you staff writer. I mean, you which start you don't get credited at the front of the show on when you're a staff writer. You get your credit at the end. But but <laughs> but it says writer, and then it's a slash, and it says all these other single things after it like no, you no. go writer and it says supervising director. It, it doesn't no? say writer. No, oh, it like my credit say. on Grey's Anatomy I see. is supervising producer on every episode. I see. Except for the ones that I wrote and then it'll say written by Krista Vernoff and I then I'll see. have the supervising produ I producer see. credit as well. Oh god. It's very complicated. <laughs> but you but you it's so important, isn't it? Your credit line. Well, I yes, I <laughs> It's important in terms of your salary and, and I, I suppose the, your level of respect. Uh, I actually sold a pilot pitch to ABC this year because I'm sort of at the level where, where I'm getting ready to sort of be creating my own shows. You can so. go yourself. I'm not a six anymore. I'm a I'm seven. An eight. I'm yeah. an eight. <laughs> Actors like to be at ten, but no, me, <laughs> I'm happy at six right now. Okay, but you'll be happier at ten. But you're happy now because you have a, a play on stage. I do. My first play. I'm, I'm very, very excited. I'm Calm. more nervous this about is, it. This is so great. Me, my guitar, and Don Henley. Yes. So I thought it was a one-woman show yeah. talking about Don Henley. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it, a lot of people think that. Um, oh, I meant to bring the postcard. I'd show you. It's a six-woman show. Uh, it's it's a show. Um, the title, the the me, my guitar, and Don Henley just comes from one of the monologues in the play. One of the characters has a dream, and she's and in which she plays it this Don Henley song and uh, mm -hmm. ends World War Three. So you know, thank mm -hmm. you know, World War Three is over thanks to me, my guitar, and Don Henley. And it, it runs as a theme throughout the play. But what it's a, what the play is about is family. It's a play about my family. So and it's very autobiographical. It's very autobiographical. It's the sixties <laughs> hippies, yeah, love chill, flower children. It's sort of about the fallout from that. It's sort of I had I, you know I've seen a lot of theater, a lot of movies, things like that about about the flower children, about that sort of era, but not so much about the children of the flower children. Sort of what that was to be raised. So this is more like what the flower children sired. What, yes, but that's I bet exactly. they're conservative. Are they conservative? The the I children mean, of the flower yes. children. I would say that all, I mean I have you know in my there are five of us in my family. I have uh, I have um, three sisters and a brother, and um, none of us have the same two. Oh, yeah. Parents. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, well, no. My, okay, Did that my, come from the uh, naked wedding? There, <laughs> Tell us about the naked <laughs> wedding. <laughs> oh, my God. And then we can get into um, this play. Yeah, well, there's the naked wedding is mentioned in the play. Um, oh, it is? Yeah. The uh, Who told you about the naked wedding? Uh, okay. <laughs> my dad, who this play is actually centered in and around the hospital around my father's death. I lost my dad uh, three and a half years ago, and I, I started writing this play shortly after. Um, my dad, when he married my stepmom, so I, I, when I was four years old, they had a naked wedding. Absolutely. I mean, really, everybody nude, was naked. No clothes. No clothes. The minister, the my minister dad, too? my step. Well, it was like one of their friends who got like ordained. You know, like now you do it on the internet. I don't know how you did it back then, but it's the same well, thing. Was it like a nudist colony, or was no, it just it was flower just, children? Was it just hippie dumb? It was just hippie dumb. I mean, it was. I was born in um, 1971. Dad and Sable got married in 1975. Um, oh, really? And, you that know, was, it was, I mean, I guess it was coming out of the, it, it was a little <laughs> late for that, but, yeah, but my, I was just gonna say. seriously, my dad clung <laughs> to the 60s, you know, through the 70s, mm -hmm. the 80s, the 90s. He was, you know, they never let that so go. So you have a lot of uh, information <laughs> inside of your head. <laughs> a lot of plays, huh? Uh, I guess so. I guess maybe. This, this one. Um, Did you yeah. take this to the taper new works? Uh, no, I am just producing this on my own right now. Oh, you I'm, did. I so, am the, no, so this is just I, yeah. Guts first. And it's, what's the name of the theater? It, it's called, it's at 2100 square feet. Oh, that's at 2100 yeah. square feet. I've, I've had other people from there. And it's this wonderful small uh, theater and they open it up to great playwrights, don't they? Yeah, well, great a, playwrights. Well, I don't, I can't, I can't say, speak Good to that, work. but I can say that it's yeah. a, it's a great space. It's a great little black box theater and I just, I, I guess I wasn't ready to put this play out. Uh, it, I, eventually, I'll get ready to sort of send it to other theaters to do with what they will. But I needed to control it a little more because than that. Because it's time. so much about you and your family. Do yes, you think? because it's hugely autobiographical, and there's a lot of stuff revealed. And I just I needed first to control it before you, I hand it over to did, someone else. Did you think of uh, writing a book about it? You know, I'm not, you know, I, I truly am not a very good narrative story writer. Oh. I, I'm a, I write dialogue. It's, I, I think in dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe someday I'll develop that skill, but as of yet, I stick to dialogue. Well, we're glad you stuck to whatever you stuck to because <laughs> thank you. you've had a very interesting time here today. And thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Krista Vernoff. Thanks. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Chef Gina Pacheco. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here with Chef Gina Pacheco, who was born and raised in Mexico City. She attended Universidad Iberoamericana, where she studied industrial engineering for two years, and then she earned a culinary degree from the same university, which is quite prestigious. How do you say it? Universidad Iberoamericana. Oh, that's just what I said. Then she went on to study at the Culinary Institute in New York. Uh, and this is kind of interesting because your specialty was flavor dynamics. What does that mean? Uh, well, it's how to cook certain ingredients, how to bring out the flavor from them. They actually have a course in flavor dynamics? Yes. And then you also went on to food and wine dynamics. What is yes. that? Is it the same? Well, it's basically how to combine wine and food. What goes well with certain oh, wine? What types of food don't combine with wine? And that's interesting. I see, because it seemed like this was an, another kind of a class that I'd never heard of. And then you took cooking techniques. Exactly. And is there something special about that? Of oh, the cooking techniques? Uh, no, I think it was very basic. But it was funny because um, a lot of people, very well prepared people take this class. So the people that I met in the class make it really interesting. I was working with the sous chef of the Pentagon. Oh, is that so, right? Why, so why do they take it? Just to learn new things? Well, yeah, I think they, they give you a little taste and little samples of what it's, on, um, what it's hot on the market. Oh, I see. So at that time it was, Mushrooms. You know? <laughs> so we tried all the mushrooms available 
and we tried uh, balsamic vinegar as well. And we tried a 50-year-old balsamic vinegar. Maybe it's not as hot right now, but it was. So they five were years bringing ago. those into the classes. Yes. Is that it? Yes. And how long do you spend? How how long is your stay at the Culinary Institute? Well, these classes are a week long. Oh, I see. So you each one of those was a week long. Yes. But then, are you learning? Are you still there learning to cook and? chop and do all that? Well, you watch a lot of food TV <laughs> <laughs> on your free time. You watch a lot of food TV? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well, the class is eight, eight hours long ah, every day. I see. So it's a long, a long day. When you got your degree from the Culinary Institute of... In Mexico, yeah. In Mexico, and you came here and mm -hmm. also studied. Then you went back to Mexico City. Exactly. And then, and and when you were there, you started working with hotels. No, it was before. It was before you went. Yeah. Well, part of my the culinary program of my school uh, was to go and work in these hotels. Ah. So it was a training program, and it's great because oh. basically you go to each and every position that you can have in a hotel, in a culinary part. So I went to three different restaurants in... At the Marriott, say. Called, yeah, let's say in the Marriott. That was a very interesting part because it was opening. So I got there with a great, great, like the executive chef that just stays there for six months and then goes and open another Marriott. So, so working with him was really good. So is that like, it's like an internship then? Yes. More or less. Oh, I see, I see. So you were, you did pastry, uh, you yes. did banquets. How did you know how to, to work with the pastry chef? I actually, I cheated a little bit because <laughs> I love the pastry uh, <laughs> station. So I did maybe two or three times my time in the pastry than in the other areas. You spent more time there? Yes. <laughs> and, um, and you had huge banquets, say, from 500 to 2,000. Yes. And that's totally different than what's on your mind now, doing catering. Yes. Well, I do s small, smaller things right now. Uh, I know. More delicate, much more, um, I don't know, I focus a little bit more in the food and not, not in the big event as Could well. Could you ever go back to doing something like that? Well, I kind of overlook the things. I um, oh. coordinate big events. Then I worked to, with American Express, and with American Express That's I coordinated I gonna, big events. I was going to ask you, uh, American Express was like 2,000 people yes. at a time. Yes, and that was great. A lot of organization is needed, and uh, I love organizing. But so. what do you do? You get the people to come in, you get chefs to come in when you're organizing, or do you actually tell them what to do? Everything. Well, basically I'm the contact between the client, that these are corporate clients, and uh, the purveyor or the hotel. So a lot of the things, of the events, we had them in hotels. So I went with the executive chef and we went over the menu and we had like radios to communicate between all of us. Where do you do all that preparation? I think nobody realizes that when you're preparing 2,000 um, uh, uh, plates, what do you do? Where yes. do you put them? Well, you need a, a kitchen, a setup kitchen, as big as the room that you're serving it. Is that right? Yes, as big as the as the banquet room? Mm -hmm. a li maybe a little bit smaller, but not very much smaller. And then they pile, don't they? They yes. have racks for yes. the... Yes, and there's like hot boxes that are connected to the light. So you can put a lot of plates and keep them warm until they're ready to go out. That's what the food... You mean they already have food on them? Yes. And they're... Oh, I see. And you did the same thing at the Intercontinental Hotel. Yes. Was it the exact same kind of program? Uh, a little bit different because of the areas that I covered, but yeah, it was the same program than in the Marriott. It's different, uh, but different areas. One thing that I saw was um, uh, Garde Manger. Yeah. Is that a station? What is that? It's basically called food preparation. So it's it's well, very what is basic. What's it called? It's salads, vinaigrettes, mayonnaise, um, basically that kind of food. And you prepare all the cold salads for all the displays for the buffets in the all different restaurants. So, like let's say a specialty restaurant, like the French restaurant, their cold salad, uh, cold pasta salad, mm. they bring it from 
the Gartman year, grand, um, I'm sorry, Gartman year. Manger or yeah, Gartman? Exactly. Is it Manger? Manger? I don't know. I didn't know okay. if it was Gard Manger. Yeah, exactly. But so that's is, that's food. what it is. It's the mm -hmm. cold food. Yes. Oh, I thought it was something you were guarding something <laughs> in the kitchen and telling them what to do. No, no, no. <laughs> so did you did you learn enough from that large scale in the hotel uh, work intern that you did there to open a restaurant? I basically learned that I didn't like working that <laughs> big scales, so I went smaller and I opened a small restaurant. Uh, for 50 people capacity. Oh, it was that it was, small? Yes, very small. And it was in Mexico City. Mexico City. And what was it? Tell us about it. It was Northern Italian cuisine. At that moment, it was like the only Northern Italian restaurant in Mexico City. And it was like the big boom of the Northern Italian. So that's basically t Tuscan food, risottos, a lot of uh, mushrooms in the pastas. And um, I add a little bit of my ideas, like a pasta with tequila and chili. So you put a little Mexican touch. Yeah. I was going to say, where did you learn about Italian food? School. Is and that it, right? Well, school and life. And I did you go to Italy? Later. Later, <laughs> but you had a, you had enough in you to open an Italian yes, restaurant. Yes. Yes. I just loved Italian food. It was my passion, Italian food, at that moment. So to, to put tequila in, what would you put tequila in? Your tomato sauce or your no, cream no, no. sauce? No, no, it was a cream sauce. In the cream sauce? <laughs> like the vodka sauce? Oh, yeah, exactly. Just, just, just tequila instead of vodka. Well, you were dealing with $2 million budgets at American Express, <laughs> yes. and then you got down to, did you uh, own the restaurant or did you have a partner? I had a partner. And so you had to deal with little tiny budgets, right? But yeah, the restaurant, uh, I opened the restaurant before American Express. Oh, you did? Yes, and um, after working a year or so in the restaurant, um, then it was too small for me, so then I went oh. big again <laughs> to American Express. Uh, were you doing all the cooking at the restaurant? Yes, all of it. So isn't it really difficult because you're not very big, and it's, it's very strenuous work being in a kitchen all the time. It is. It, it's stressful. It is. Uh, but I had a good cooker, cook uh, You guys. had a staff? Yes. You, do you, staff you have good. to find the people that you can work with yes. in a little cl small yeah. area? It was very small. Very, <laughs> very small. So it, we were three in the kitchen. And uh, I think the kitchen was for one and a half, no more. Yes. <laughs> so but you did the menu. You yes. did the decor. Yes. I hired even the waiters and the barmans and everyone. Uh, the owner, I think he liked me and he trusted me. So he let you do what you yes. wanted. And then you came to Los Angeles. I don't know, how long have you been in Los Angeles? Two years. Oh, that's all? Yeah, that's oh, all. Oh, and you're doing a food segment on Univision? Yes. What do you do for your food segment? Well, it's, I love it. It's, it's very short, it's just five minutes, but I give fast and easy recipes for everyday food uh, and I is it it's on television right yes so you have all the ingredients there well it's not live oh so you, can, you have all the ingredients yes in five minutes it's very hard to prepare something but it is and it's easy to do it in half hour so <laughs> basically we do it in half hour and then we edit it to five minutes and what do you what would be one thing that you well, like my first recipe, I love this example because it's so much like I do and all the rest. Um, I have a baby lima bean soup and a tomato broth. The tomato broth is very Mexican. So I use a lot of Latin influences in this. And then um, I use baby lima beans to, and I pour them in the boiling uh, broth, tomato broth. And I add mint and I serve it with fresh cheese and um, baby lima beans cook in f 10 minutes. Yeah, really fast. We have that same soup, but with faba beans in Mexico oh. that we have to soak them overnight, overnight and then cook them oh, for I three see. hours. I see. So it's a day and a half preparation that I make in 15 in, minutes. In 15, so, so you're looking for all those Mexican res uh, recipes, but with a new twist. I do, I do a lot of Latin and I also add 
Maybe a little bit of Italian, a no, little bit do. of Indian. I, I, I want to talk about this because this smells so great. Yeah, this is for, of my catering menu. I have a catering business. You're as catering, well. yeah. So this is uh, from my catering menu, and this are mushrooms in escabeche. Escabeche. So it's mushrooms, onion, chili, because I took a piece, just a little touch of it, yes. and my mouth was burning. But well, it's delicious. What would you do with this? You make tacos with them. Oh, you you use taco. tortillas so and you, you make a taco use with that them. And put uh -huh. it in. Okay. And then you have something over by you that I wanted to show. This is. This is chicken mole with uh, green beans and red rice. And what's mole? Try it. It's, it's a sauce made with mm. all these chilies that you see here um, almonds nuts, chocolate. Um, you've heard of the famous chocolate sauce. Well, it's this. And it just has a little bit of chocolate, and it's unsweetened chocolate, just pure cocoa, if you can. Because it sounds really disgusting to have chocolate with your, with your hot sauce. Because it's not sweet. That's so why. And the idea that you have of chocolate you use all is... These I'm going to hold this here, sure. too. Well, you so use you basically it. this, too, and the chipotle ones that are this. They're all dried, all these chilies are yes, dried? Yes, these are chipotles too. These um, are different kind of chipotles, the kind that I use in the escabeche. And these are well, the regular ones. They have a different ones. color too, don't they? They make a different yeah, color. Yeah, they're different kinds. And these are the ones that you buy canned. And, um, and they dry, they're dry? They're dry, so to work with them, you have to first toast them um. or fry them. I prefer to toast them. In this? Yeah, just toast so them. Just toast it and that's in, it? In a, in a dry pan and then put them in, soak them in hot, hot water for 30 minutes. Okay, before we go, really <laughs> quickly, the last great thing. I want to taste this one this too. This is a three milk cake and it's three milk because it's just a vanilla cake and it's wet with uh, three milks. It's <laughs> evaporated milk, condensed milk, and then milk, regular milk. Is that right? What's evaporated milk and condensed milk? Different? Evaporated, it's just concentrated milk. It's in a can? Basically, it's in a can and uh, condensed milk as well. Condensed milk is sweetened. Oh, I see. So one, sw oh, they're both in cans, yes. but one sweetened and one isn't. Yes. Oh, this was all so good <laughs> and it smells so great. And I'm so glad you came to the to America <laughs> to have your catering Yeah, business. well, I got married and that's what brought me that's here, my <laughs> husband. <laughs> great. Thanks, Gina. Thank you. Joe, and thank for you inviting. for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, LA 917.